Hello, everybody. We're going to get started. I think we have other people who are going to be coming, but they can kind of come in and fill in as, as we go. Uh, I'm Mark Camlet. I'm provost here at Carnegie Mellon. And uh, thank you very much for coming to what I'm sure is going to be a very interesting conversation. This is the first ever of, I guess, what we're calling the Innovators Forum. Wanted to say a few words of background, and then we'll get down to the forum itself. So innovation, in all of its meanings, has been a hallmark of Carnegie Mellon in many ways for a very long time. But in the last decade or so, it's assumed an increasingly important role for us in its meaning and relationship to our entrepreneurship, commercialization, formation of companies, and as an engine of economic development. And also, as one of the most important ways, our faculty, students, and alumni can have extraordinary impact on society. One of the ways that this emphasis um, on innovation uh, is played out here is through our own, Carnegie Mellon's own technology transfer operations, including what we now call the innovation ecosystem and our so-called uh, uh, green light startup efforts. These span the tech transfer office, uh, a variety of uh, new tech transfer policies that I think are state of the art among our peer institutions, the Olympus Project, the Don Jones Center, uh, and uh, other activities. Uh, many of these efforts are overseen by our Vice President for Research, Rick McCullough, who's in the front row. He can wave and credit, the credit is his. Uh, these efforts connect students, faculty, and alumni with on-campus resources that foster startups from early stage businesses, uh, financing to incubator space and connection with investors. And I think that by almost any measure, our efforts in this area over the past decade have been very successful. Uh, you may not know this, a little known fact, but over the last four years, Carnegie Mellon has had more new companies spin out from the university per million dollars of external research funding than any other university in the United States. And the role of our spin outs and of companies formed by our alumni um, on the Pittsburgh region's economy are more and more part of the Pittsburgh story of transformation. Well, so much for the advertisement for today's uh, uh, talk, although if you want to know more about these activities, I think there's some brochures on the way out, and be sure to, to pick one up. So for our first Innovators Forum, we're very pleased indeed to have with us Dr. Jonathan Rothberg. Dr. Rothberg has an extraordinary record of leading in, uh, and has been a leading innovator for almost 20 years at the interface of life sciences and technology. He graduated from Carnegie Mellon in 1985 in chemical engineering with a concentration in biomedical engineering. He received his master's and PhD degree from Yale in biology. He's a life trustee on our board of trustees. In the period since he graduated, he has defined and then redefined the technology of genetic sequencing. He's done this so far through five companies the most recent being Ion Torrent, of which he is CEO and chairman. Ion Torrent combines genetic biology with integrated chip technology in an astounding leap forward. Human genome sequencing machines now literally fit on the, on a desktop at one tenth or less of the cost of machines that previously did genetic sequencing. They have increased the speed of sequencing by an order of magnitude. They've decreased the cost accordingly. And these efforts have opened up one of the most important key doors that will lead to the age of personalized medicine, as which will bring in an era of whole new approaches to the way we try to understand and fight cancer, track infections, design biofuels, and much more. Uh, Jonathan's approach to sequencing gen genomes has introduced the area of what we might call personal genomics, and its use is currently underway at most major pharmaceutical companies, universities, genome centers, and medical centers around the world. In a cover story from Forbes magazine just earlier this year, the writer hypothesized that Jonathan's inventions, quote, could have as dramatic an impact as any technology since the uh, personal computer unquote, and kickstarts a $100 billion uh, industry. 
Among his many honors, Johnson has been recognized three times as the World Economic Forum's technology pioneer, was an Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year, received the Wall Street Journal's first gold medal for innovation, and is a member of the National Academy of Engineering. And Jonathan, welcome. We are so pleased to have you. And perhaps you'll join me up here. Thank you. Welcome. Well, Jonathan and I promised each other none of us would jump on the couch. Is that a... <laughs> or cry. <laughs> or, or cry. At least I'll try not to. Um, what I'm going to do is start off with a few questions. And Jonathan, you take these questions wherever, wherever you wish. But uh, also, as you have questions you'd like to ask, uh, midway through, we'll, we'd like to shift this to questions from the audience. When we do that shift, there are microphones. If I could ask you to go up to them just so we can so we can hear your, your questions. OK, let me start off by asking you uh, how you began your career as an entrepreneur. Uh, not to make a bad joke, but is it in your DNA? Uh, or, or did CMU have anything to do with it? Or how did this all come to be? Both. Oh, very good. So my uh, father was an entrepreneur, and my father was a chemical engineer. So I had to be an entrepreneur and a chemical engineer. And so I uh, came to Carnegie Mellon. Uh, and while I studied uh, chemical engineering, uh, I loved the computer science, uh, the cognitive psychology that was going on at the time, and the biomedical engineering. Uh, so it was both in my DNA. And then at Carnegie Mellon, I first started to think about DNA sequencing. And for those of you who are from the computer science side, I'll put it in, in a way that you can easily understand. Uh, the genome of an organism is its computer program. The only difference is your programs are reduced to ones and zeros, and the computer programming language of life is these Watson Crick uh, bases that you've heard a lot about. And there's four of them, A, C, G, T. So whether you're an AIDS virus and your instruction set is 9,000 of these, a bacteria and your instruction set is 5 million of these, or each of you, which has these uh, ACGTs aligned on your chromosomes, and you have 3 billion from your mom and 3 billion from your dad. So that's the language of life. And uh, Frederick Sanger in the late 70s worked out a way using radioactivity to decode it. It was slow and manual. And I had to do it here at Mellon Institute. And it took me months to get 200 of these letters in order. And I said, I got to automate this. <laughs> How, uh, what, 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 what? animal were you using at the I time? I was sequencing a virus called adenovirus whose entire genetic code is spelled out in about 30,000 of those letters. So I'm curious to follow up a little bit about your time here at Carnegie Mellon. I don't know who you would look back on as your mentors, but I do understand that a person that you did have a chance to interact with uh, at the time was Steve Jobs. And there are a number of similarities I think of as a complete layperson in these domains, but the personalization and to some degree maybe even the democratization of what he was able to do in the space of uh, computers and then subsequently seems awfully to have some thematic linkages to what you have accomplished and are working so hard on in terms of personal genomics. And I just wondered if you could say a few words if, about your interactions with Steve and sort of where if, if any of my speculations I will. are correct. And, uh, let's go back, if we can, to 1985. It was a little bit different than now. And I wanted to be an entrepreneur, studying chemical engineering, had been introduced to a problem that I knew was ripe to be fixed. It was a pain in the butt, the sequence. However, at that time, I thought that people that were entrepreneurs and had done great things like Hewlett and Packard or uh, Noyce, and more at Intel, I thought they had 
They were made of something different, like there was some magic pixie dust. And one of those people that I had admired for years was Steve Jobs, and had been you know, collecting every news clipping, every magazine, and he was speaking, uh, I think it was the basement of the library, <laughs> and uh, there was a bunch of students. Today we let him actually speak yeah, together. Yeah, but. but it was underground, uh, and he was taking questions, and one of the questions led him to discuss that there was no pixie dust. He basically said, he figured out that the only difference between Hewlett Packard and his idols and Polaroid, his idols, and himself, was that they just did it. And this is before the Nike commercial. Yeah. <laughs> but at the time, that was an incredible aha moment in my life. And it was the simplest lesson. You just do it. And now looking back, uh, 25 years to 30 years, I just calculated since I walked through some of those halls, you, you realize that it is just about doing it. And so many people are frozen. So it was nice hearing uh, at Carnegie Mellon, you're, you're making it so people will just do it. You're teaching them that they can do it. You're putting in the structure. You're putting in the financing. You're giving them the mentorship. Because that's the biggest obstacle. And to this day, another reunion, I was with my wife in Montreal, and one of her classmates walked up to me, and he says, like, how did you ever have the courage to just do it? And I was thinking, because you just do. And it was, and he had never done it. And it was, you know, it was 30 years into his life, and he'd always watched all these people do it. And so I was lucky that I was here, and I got to see someone that just told me really early, you just do it. And I know that's not so profound, but it was amazing to me. Uh, at that moment. That's fascinating. So you started a number of companies. I don't know, I said five. Is that, is that approximately I so. correct? Approximately. So, so as you look back, uh, what, what are the things that uh, uh, were, were, were the most sort of I important steps for you to take and what were the things looking back on it that were missteps, if, if, if any? I mean, I was trying to think as a, a career as a serial yeah, entrepreneur, absolutely. what are the, both the, the, the things too and then also well, when I was when I was at Carnegie Mellon, I actually had two loves, and uh, even though I was a chemical engineering student, I was only a chemical engineering student because I thought chemical engineers had the best toolbox to mm -hmm. solve any problem. So that's why I was a chemical engineer. I did not want to do petroleum. I wanted to take chemical engineering into another field and take that rigor. And I had known it was too late to take chemical engineering into electronics because that gave us the trillion dollar semiconductor industry and modern electronics. It was the chemical engineers that went there and they turned it into this glorious process that works and was underneath Moore's Law. Mm -hmm. And so I knew that was too late. And so there were two things I was interested in. One was biology and mostly the biology around, and this is Carnegie Mellon bias, life's programming, which means mm -hmm. DNA. Not proteins, not these other things. And it's interesting because over the last 20 years, the 30, any scientist that studied DNA went on and did great things, and the ones that worked on the other things didn't make as much progress. It, it was easier and better and it was digital, if you will. So I was, had biology I wanted to impact, but I had loved, and I had taken a course with the uh, Herb Simon, who's one of the fathers of artificial intelligence and I think one of the only real polymaths I'd ever met. Mm -hmm. And he taught thinking. And he was asking questions which have to be one of the big three questions, right? You know, how did the universe come about? Okay, that's a big one. That's good for the physicist. You know, what was the first life? Okay, that's a, that's a big one. How did we start self-replicating? And consciousness. And he was tackling one of the big three. And that was so sexy to me. But I, from my chemical engineering vantage point, looked at it and said, one, I'm not sure I can have a big impact, and two, I was skeptical anybody would have an impact. But I thought if I could bring chemical engineering to biology, I could do what the chemical engineers had done to electronics or other fields that they had gone to, and that it was an open field. 
So I knew I had to get my domain knowledge. Mm -hmm. Outside of Carnegie Mellon, people didn't even know what domain knowledge meant. <laughs> but the computer scientists always would say, hey, let's go study a chess player and learn his domain. Mm -hmm. And so I knew I had to go rip off the domain knowledge from the biologist. So I decided i take my chemical engineering toolbox and go learn the domain of molecular biology. So you're uh, extraordinarily accomplished as a scientist. You're extraordinarily accomplished as a business person and as an entrepreneur. So which is the bigger challenge to you in making the companies that you've put together work? Your activities and vision as a scientist or in terms of the business, the management, and that end of things? Wow. Uh, being a father. <laughs> that, that, that's the number one challenge. I have two in diapers now and three older ones. But that's a story for another time. But uh, <laughs> that is a great question, and it's evolved. Mm -hmm. And so when I came out of graduate school, I had a plan to go work for a place like Merck, find a team of people that had the expertise to start a company. But I was visiting another academic, and uh, Lynn Jelinski, who was running biotechnology, Mike, Phil Mike will probably know Lynn, at Cornell. And I was talking about this opportunity to uh, mine the human genome for potential drugs. And she just said to me, and I was like, oh, what a flashback, why don't you just do it? And I came back from Cornell uh, with a friend who was there, uh, Greg Wendt, uh, who's chemical engineer from Carnegie Mellon, and we decided to just do it. At that point, venture capital didn't give un, uh, freshly minted PhDs money to start companies to mine the human genome because there was no human genome. And there hadn't really been in uh, 1990 that culture. It just wasn't established yet. Uh, so we wrote grants just like an ac academic would. And we wrote grants that are at the intersection of computer science, chemical engineering. We would make processes to get the information from the human genome and then mine those processes. And Greg and myself got $15 million worth of grants. And that's when $15 million was a lot of money. And did you teach yourself the business dimensions of all this as, as, as on the fly? As, as we did, well? but I would tell you for my first company, it was more a scientific success than a business success. Mm -hmm. And scientific successes were great. We were the first ones to mine uh, some genomes and make what we call maps of every gene in the genome, what protein it would make, how they functioned in biological pathways. And for a small company, our science was outstanding. Outside of Genentech, which people know is an incredibly good scientific company, very few companies got this cover of nature and uh, science. We got the cover of both. Well, and so we did great science. It was a boom time uh, from 1998 to 2000, as some of you may remember. And so while we didn't do great business, we did great business deals. And so we were able to do deals that were huge. We had farmers literally send us checks with $75 million down payments. We were able to be rock stars of the stock market. You know, so my stock went from five to 200 and we were worth more than American Airlines. And I think all the steel companies put together at the time. <laughs> but many of them had negative net worth, so that didn't mean much. Uh, so, but it was better science. Uh, and the science was good, but there was, there was gaps in, in, in the business. For instance, the most promising drug we developed, now as I'm speaking to you, I was literally looking at Wikipedia for something, I was meeting with somebody who does breast cancer, and the drug we developed is now one of the most promising drugs uh, for triple negative breast cancer. It's great, but that's 10 years later. And it's hard to raise money to skate for 10 years. And so, great science, uh, great timing, and the science translated into good medicine, but the business didn't connect. And not being defensive, but it turns out the business failed for everybody, not just the little guys, 
but Pfizer over the last decade has lost more market cap than anybody else. Uh, nobody has figured out the business of pharmaceuticals. And so in 1999, when I was right at the top, my son was born, Noah. He was rushed to the newborn intensive care unit not breathing. And I realized I didn't care about mining genomes generically, which was the company was set up to do. I cared about his personal genome. There was a computer magazine there and it had a picture of a Pentium chip. And I realized everybody had been doing it wrong. That sequencing I had been doing in the lab here at Carnegie Mellon had gone from one guy into a lab to hundreds of guys in an auditorium. <laughs> but it hadn't changed. They had changed x-rays to fluorescence, but still electro that, that's still radiation, just light. And it, and it hadn't changed. And I, I had an aha moment that I could make it small. And I had a, to answer your business question, I had a business aha moment. And that was, it was pretty damn hard to make a drug because it takes $800 million to get to the finish line and decades. However, not so hard to make tools. So my me next adventure was good science, but much better business. But we made a mistake, and hopefully we'll get back to it because I don't want to I want to make sure you ask more questions. But so that was way better of business. Uh, our first full year of sales, and again, it's not software, we're making a machine and selling it. Our first full calendar year was over $100 million. And for a company that's making a machine, that's a big deal. I ended up making other mistakes, and I found myself not owning it. And that's where I felt like Steve Jobs was like, how do you found the company and then not own it? And, you know, so. So, it, so it's been a progression. So first good science, not so much on the business. Then good science, good business, not so much on this thing called, you know, like control and who sees your destiny. And so I think I learned, I make a mistake, take the receipt and fix it in the next one. <laughs> so, so can you talk a little bit about what your current company does with the personal Genome sequencer, I've seen the pictures that sits on a desktop yeah. and it goes so much more quickly. Can you talk a little bit, I mean, how it does it and where it's going and what you see as kind of the evolution of that particular path that you've been I, now I, going I on for a while? Just quickly, again, it will work here. My first machine was the first time that someone could sequence massively parallel and really fast or high throughput. And that was a company called 454. And it was fantastic. And we did the Neanderthal genome. We did the first human genome, Jim Watson as an individual. There had been a public effort, but it was a collection. But, and most people don't know this, but how many of you know what a VAX computer is or a PDP-11? Because now when I'm in audiences and I say it was like the mini computer, they think this is a mini computer. <laughs> I swear to God. So that was the mini computer of a time. It cost a half a million, but it was pretty good compared to before nobody could do it. But, uh, so, so that was there. This new machine is something that's 10 times cheaper, 10 times faster, and is analogous to the personal computer on another number of levels. One, you can afford it. Mm -hmm. Two, it, like the personal computer, beat those other machines because they realized the power of the microprocessor and all that Moore's Law lecture and all those semiconductor industries. And so my next company, I said, I'm going to leverage the semiconductor. And I would make a chip that just like the chip in your cell phone, which sees light, takes a picture, we would make a new semiconductor device. We started from scratch and made it that saw chemistry. So that's a little bit how it works. But let me tell you what it enables. So this summer, uh, as many of you probably followed, there was an outbreak in Germany. Uh, over 800 people had kidney failure, over 50 people died, and it was because of an E. coli strain that was different than, clearly different than anybody had ever seen or eaten before. And two groups, while the outbreak was happening, decoded the five million letters that specified that organism, all the instructions for that organism. And so that's what the machine enabled. And it enabled it because the machine was cheap. And we had a good business model. We had partnered 
with somebody that could sell it across the world. And it was super fast, and it was super simple. So one of the groups that cracked this outbreak was a group that owns the most of the other machines. But when there was an outbreak, and they had to do it quick, they did it on our little machine that at first everybody laughed at. <laughs> and so what it does is it enables anybody to quickly read off millions of bases or hundreds of millions of bases of these letters, or now billions, uh, but it allows them to do it with only a 50,000 investment. And in this case, the group that did it put the data on the internet. And it turns out, while they sequenced it, it was people literally crowdsourcing, looking at these bases, using their software to figure out, oh, this is a new bug. Oh, this bug is resistant to 14 antibiotics. Oh, this bug stole a gene from another organism that allowed it to stick to guts that also was killing the kidneys. And it, and it got dis dissected. So the machine uh, looks like a desktop printer, costs less than $50,000. It's made in the same factories that make Xboxes. It uses disposable chips that are made in the same factories that make the insides of your computers. And it allowed those scientists for $99 in two hours to, to decode that genome. And then through a lot of smart people around the world, figure out what that sequence meant. So that's what our current company does. And it turns out its most popular use now is studying 20 to 200 genes, not whole genomes, not all three billion, but looking at 20 to 200 genes depending on your interest in real patients. So Baylor College of um, Medicine and their, their associated hospitals this December are taking all the, pan, uh, all the cancer patients and looking at about 600 places in your genome on this chip and using it to say uh, uh, on a molecular level to tell the patient about the cancer, see if there's particular medicines you might respond to. But to be fair, it's mostly collecting information that along with how that patient responds and which patients progress badly and which patients progress well, will make correlations that in the next five years that test will be more powerful. I want to be really careful on, uh, on this whole sequencing. It's, it's great, it's amazing, but we're still in the data gathering mode. And I have sequenced Jim Watson's genome, and I've sequenced Gordon Moore's genome, and my wife tells me you just learned about two white 80-year-olds. <laughs> All right? So, uh, there was probably very little that we could learn about them. However, as part of medicine, there's a lot we can do. And so there are things we can do now, and I'll give you concrete things. So you can make one test that you can run on this machine really quickly that would tell you, because it's scanning the whole genome, for the 146 genes that account for 95% of all genetic birth defects and all genetic diseases. So that's something you can do now, and you can scan for those things. And in this audience, 56% of you will be a carrier of one of those 146 genetic mutations. So that's something you can do now. Right now, I can tell people whether they have a high chance of Parkinson's disease, whether they have a high chance of Alzheimer's. I can't do anything, it's not actionable. However, we all feel strongly, because we have enough demonstrations, uh, that these machines and people who are pioneers collecting data with these machines and people who are pioneers doing computer science and doing correlations between drug response in these genes, outcome in these machines, will make it that seven years from now, when on a newer generation of those chips, I sequence all three billion of your base pairs, We'll make it so we can tell you a lot more. But it's going to be a, another decade of, of data gathering. And I think that's missed a lot. And so I'm one of the people that say, hey, next year we'll be doing $1,000 genomes. So I'm guilty of that. But what you get out of that genome is going to take a, a decade of a lot of people's really hard work. Uh, it will help some people now. So we've, we've sequenced individual kids that the parents didn't know why their kids had a neurological disorder. And with collaborators, we were able to say, hey, they have this gene broken, and I'm sorry, and it gave closure to the parents 
that didn't lead to the treatment. Mm -hmm. In other cases, a colleague of mine sequenced his children, and they had were having terrible uh, health problems, and it turned out the defect was something that was metabolic and that you could change it with diet, and they changed their lives. But that's the exception. And, and so the power of this tool uh, is high in genetics, it's low in complex diseases now, it's medium in cancer, but getting stronger, but we have to start doing these things now and doing it. I just want to be careful that it's not like my first, you know, you don't, it, uh, drugs aren't going to just come off the analysis. Diagnostics for the next 10 years and drugs will probably be 20 years. But just like AIDS, which had 9,000 letters, became a chronic disease, cancer, where there's probably four or 600 genes that are being broken, and probably, you know, couple, tens of, of millions of these letters that are involved, I think will become a chronic disease too because our tools are a thousand times more powerful. So before I get to my next question, which will be hopefully a follow-up to what you're speaking about, I have an important question on the side. What's 454? <laughs> <laughs> which was the name of his, one of yeah, his prior companies. Yeah, it, it was just, it, it was just a, a, a code name. And uh, <laughs> I, I think the only person that will know is my son. I'll tell him why. Okay. But it's great for people to uh, ask questions. You know, I always get asked before is what does it stand for? So it's... Maybe that's the reason. Okay. <laughs> so, so uh, he, he, uh, following up on the the theme that you're talking about about the 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 the, the sheer amount of uh, data, sheer amount of information, what could be done. Uh, it sounds like there's a lot of things that can be done, but a huge kind of frontier looking uh, ahead. I'm sort of wondering if you can say anything. Maybe also this is highly speculative, but here at CMU, we're so strong in machine learning. We're so strong in huge data sets, so strong as uh, areas of computational biology. Is, is there a role to be played between that frontier that we're pushing out and the directions you've gone as you've moved biology into uh, integrated circuits? Uh, the answer is absolutely positively, and there's so many blatant concrete examples of it. And so right now, what do you think costs more? sequencing your genome, any of you, or processing and storing the data. Processing and storing the data is about three times more expensive than me sequencing it. And a big part of that might be just storing it. And so we spend $6,000 per year in the United States on healthcare. So it makes sense to spend $1,000 to sequence a genome for, for a sick child. Right now, it does make sense. But it will be hard to justify to spend 15000 to analyze the data, and it will be impossible to do the big studies I told you we have to do. To really understand this, we've got to sequence a million people. The numbers don't work out if you have to spend 15000 on the analysis. Math doesn't work. And I'm convinced that the computer scientists can solve it and have to go into it in a big way and fast. I don't think the sky is falling. I get reporters calling me all the time. You know, it's all going to fail because of the computer science. And I don't think it's too big of a problem. I think the right people just haven't worked on it. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you go to these genome centers, which got the majority of the money, and even me, who got a lot of money from federal funding, I got a huge amount of money from these genome programs to develop this technology. I, I wrote grants at Curigen, I wrote grants at 454, I wrote grants and got a, the biggest yearly grant for ION for this technology. The genome centers got money to sequence, uh, but very few dollars were spent on how to analyze it. They're changing it a little bit. So now maybe 15 cents out of a dollar will be dedicated to well, it. Maybe there's people in the audience who are going to be able to participate but, in that end of things. But I think it's at least as big as a problem. And it's probably worth more than the 15 cents yeah. out of the dollar to, to do the computation when it's three times as much of a cost. Yeah. So I'm not uh, trying to get you to start your sixth company yet, but uh, looking ahead, what, uh, what, what comes next? Well, I love that you said that because I actually think that the answer for the genome analysis is, is in corporate. So there's at least eight efforts, public and private, Every venture capitalist is calling me. I get emails, do you advise some new company to do bioinformatics? And I actually think it should be free. And I think it should be done by people, like the people in this audience at Carnegie Mellon. 
and uh, it should grow as a community resource because everybody wants to do the exact same thing. You want to analyze the genome to help a scientist discover something. You want to analyze the genome to help a physician talk to his patient. I'm not envisioning a 23andMe where the patient goes to a computer. I'm envisioning a parent or parents are talking to a physician about their child and the physician needs a little bit of help, a lot of help. And so they sequence the genome and the physician in that computer program helps. And so what I'm trying to encourage is for academics to, to make that doctor in a box so that, that physician ha has help. And I think that's the way to do it because I watch the genome centers do it and I admire these guys, they're my friends. They're not the same level of computer scientists that you have here. Uh, but they do have the domain expertise. And they're, they have the sequence. So, and this, so I think you have to do something like that. And I'd love to help. I would love to do a conference on this topic. So this, this but no will, company. This, no company. No, so, I think it's going to be free. That would be better than that. So, 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 so this will be like a Watson in, in a box? Or? I got in trouble today on that. <laughs> so no, it's going to be a doctor in a box. Okay, sorry. <laughs> and so it's your genetic counselor that works with your primary physician. And he gives it the medical records, he gives it that. And it will work today on simple things. And it will probably work better than most doctors, but not a genetic, uh, you know, someone with a fellowship. But I think in the next three years, it will probably be better. Well, I have some things I'd like to continue to ask, but now is probably a good time to also say, if there are questions from the audience, if you raise your hand, I'll call on you, or even better, if you come up to the, uh, to the mics, I'll be happy to, uh, to recognize you as well. So don't, don't be shy, and uh, please feel free to, to, to ask, ask I do away. have one other plug on, please. on companies and something that I'm doing here with people at Carnegie Mellon. I would love people to go back to the invention of ultrasound, the invention of CAT scan, and the invention of MRI, which are all invented using the computer power that the people had on hand. Mm. And I think they can all be rethought. And so I don't want to just use computer algorithms to look at an MRI image. I want to use it to change the way people do MRI, or maybe use different physics to do it. Mm. And we're sponsoring a conference that will be a Carnegie Mellon in, in January, because I do think there's incredible opportunity to take computer power and relook at it. And maybe you won't need uh, a five million dollar six Tesla magnet because you now have, I think, a million times more computing power per dollar than when the guys invented that. So th this next question is perhaps in a slightly different direction, but when I think of uh, U.S. competitiveness. And I think, uh, and even as I was mentioning about the focus that we have had at CMU on entrepreneurship as a, a key direction for making sure our, our students are well prepared if that's the direction they want to go, certainly in thinking about the impact here on the Pittsburgh region uh, um, of, of spin-outs from, from, from Carnegie Mellon. But, but more generally, as we find ourselves in a world where there's such uh, challenges for the U.S. to remain competitive. It seems like our flexibility or our propensity up to now in entrepreneurship has remained one of our, one of our strong cards. And I was wondering if you could say just a few words of your thoughts, uh, based on your experiences and, uh, and, and, and your own just thinking and looking ahead for America, where you see this entrepreneurship playing as we, as we move ahead. Uh, obviously, I think it's critical, and I actually think I have very little to offer the universities. I actually think, and Carnegie Mellon's a model, they're doing exactly the right thing. They're, they're, they're pushing math, they're pushing science, they're pushing engineering, and they're, they're saying, look at real-world problems, use it to solve it, and we'll put incubators, and we'll put com uh, companies on the campus. So I, I think the universities actually are getting an A. Mm -hmm. But and this happens to me over and over again when I, I start a company. When I start a company, I go through the literature. And so when I wanted to make a chip that sequenced, I went through the literature, and I found that someone had invented a transistor in the 1970s, and I wanted to use it. And I found uh, a thesis 
of someone who had used those transistors, and I wanted that student. But it turns out they were in another country. I couldn't bring them here. Uh, another case, real case, and I gotta watch out because you're tape recording it, but there was somebody here who had just got a postdoc from a, a US university, but he was from Namibia, and I was working with him, and I wanted his help in, in my new company. Have you ever tried, not the academics, because you guys can actually get people from other countries, but if you're in a company, and you want to keep somebody who's from Namibia, they're convinced <laughs> they're going to blow something up, or who knows what. Yeah. And so we got around it, because it turns out his like grandparents come from Germany, so we use the German passport. <laughs> then, because they have this right of return from Germany or whatever, so we got a German passport, and uh, the lawyers made $80,000 for me to figure out how to keep this guy so I could start a company which has generated, this one's generated about 400 jobs, which isn't bad. Uh, uh, economically, we raised uh, $725 million. And I needed this guy, just this one guy, because he was a chemist that knew the chemistry that I needed. And so I do think you guys are doing it all right, but if we only did one thing, mm -hmm. we should say, Please, if you're educated in the United States, that would be my first thing, don't kick them out as soon as they leave the university. Yeah. It is the biggest mistake we do. I I'm convinced, so you look at this 14 trillion deficit, I could fix three trillion of it in a single decision <laughs> politically. Keep them. I know how to even get the, the other. I got an answer for your 11 trillion. So 14 goes down to 11. Anybody? that has an engineering or science degree, and you guys can give me the list of institutions from 140 countries, that if they have that degree, advanced degree, let them come to the United States. Mm -hmm. And I promise you the entire deficit will go away and I don't care how you tax, because taxing is just moving beans around. Different guys got the beans. There's never a single additional bean. So I'd like more beans. And the only guys that make more beans, are the guys you train in technology, so let's keep them. And that's a third of our deficit. And let's let them come, and that's the rest of it. Well, maybe. Because you're already doing all the right things. They all want to come here. You're teaching them the entrepreneurship. And then when they graduate, you're making them leave. It's like a joke. Well, maybe we can uh, staple a uh, green card onto every graduation certificate. It yeah. would be fun. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. three trillion dollars, easily three trillion dollars. <laughs> we'll split it. That's okay. <laughs> but you guys are doing the right thing. Thank you. The, the tragedy nice is say. after you get them all gung ho, you say trick two, gotta go, and and it's real. Yeah. I mean, I have this over and over and over again, and it's impossible mm -hmm. to hire somebody in the United States that has a specific skill, because mm -hmm. if they're a foreigner, just, it's impossible. Unless, again, you pay your lawyers $80,000 per, and we make up visa things. Last guy mm -hmm. I kept, I kept it on an O visa. Does anybody even know what an O visa is? Okay. <laughs> and so I had to have famous professors from around the world claim that this was a person of extraordinary ability. And they were, but it was $80,000 to keep somebody in the United States. Do, do you do any of your stuff overseas? I mean, do you, do you, do you the, use the, science, the, scientists overseas? The answer is we do chip manufacturing overseas. Yeah. And that, that's sad. And you guys know the story behind that. We don't train enough engineers to, to keep the plants running. So, so you've been active, you've had interests across a broad range. And I know that some of them, as they're manifested here at CMU, have been your fascination and your promotion of some very appreciated uh, explorations here in brain sciences and imaging, and you had made a quick reference uh, uh, a little bit ago to, to that. C could you talk a little bit more about it, both your interest in it, but also where you see that domain going? It's a similar but somewhat different than the specifics of the gene sequencing. Uh, so I go back, I said, it's gonna be really inexpensive to sequence, but for anybody in the sciences, you know that's only half the problem. The other half is you have to have information on the person you're sequencing. Right. You know, okay, blue eyes, then you figure out which gene makes blue eyes. Okay, cystic fibrosis, you figure out which gene makes cystic fibrosis. 
I think the best way to get comprehensive information is imaging, right? So you might be able to learn a lot uh, about a person by, by imaging. You can see their tumors, you, can, uh, you might even go through bone density and find out what you have to do with it. As you start doing functional stuff, you'll get the genes for cognition. Mm -hmm. When we did Neanderthal, the reason I wanted to do that project was not because I cared about uh, a relative of a man that separated from us 600,000 years ago. What I cared about is that Homo sapiens with beautiful drawings. Neanderthal never crossed the body of water if you didn't see the other side. When Homo sapiens came out of Africa, we ended up on Easter Island. So we were creative, we were brave. I wanted to know what the difference was. And it turns out that there are probably only 200 proteins that are different between us and Neanderthal that Neanderthal shares with chimpanzees. So I put chimpanzees in the end of all one bucket on your computer program, and you put us in the other, and it turns out there's only 200. So I think they're probably pretty important for putting on clothes, talking, and having seminars. <laughs> and so you get a handle on those kinds of things. Well, we appreciate that interest. But now the functional guys can watch people think. Yeah. I, is this a brave person who's going to ask a question? No, oh, brave. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon. I did not walk in at the very begin. Excuse me, at the very beginning of the forum. My name is Blanche Smith. I'm a Carnegie Mellon alum, HNSS, and I am a PhD student that has a small business. I'm a NYMEX Energy and Metals contractor. Okay. Um, my family is engineering, going towards military and surveillance work, and on my father's side, they um, are pharmacology. This biotech uh, entrepreneurship, I live in the Chicagoland area. I have a satellite office in the Chicagoland area in DuPage County in Addison, okay? They were discussing something like this at Oregon Health Sciences University in my hometown, but they were also discussing something like this at Northwestern University, specifically talking about fish technologies, and I can't exactly remember what that acronym stands for, but I know that it's going in the direction of, when you start talking about genomes, you start talking about looking at diseases people are predisposed to by their DNA that is also combined with what their family health history is, yep. okay? So you're talking about a combination of pharmacology and pharmacognosy, and in the modern day with the health crisis, there are two different ways of managing people with terminal life conditions, and actually, it's more, not two different ways, it's more of a combination. It's a balance of pharmacology, okay, and traditional healing, okay? So, and whether you have diabetes, whether you have, uh, more recently, there's a lot of people with irritable bowel syndrome, okay, colitis, Crohn's disease. What you're talking about is the constitution is weak. Okay, the essence of the Constitution is weak, but they're having a life emergency, okay? Extreme bleeding in the colon. Now, traditional healing is not going to, to heal that emergency. Biotechnology is going to heal that emergency, particularly pharmacology. So at the point of making money, at what point do you start giving advice based on doing the study on the genome of what combination this individual needs in order to manage their particular health situation? I like the question uh, because mm. my wife, who's a, mm. a physician, mm. uh, studies uh, metastatic melanoma. Okay. And when she sees patients or people have metastatic melanoma, they tell them, well, there's a 50% chance you'll be fine, mm -hmm. and there's a 50% chance you'll recur. The problem is they'll tell you which side of the coin you're on. Mm. And so what she works on mm. is using these technologies, including sequencing is one of them, okay. to try to, and she's an epidemiologist, so she does it with lots of people, and right. statistics, this is what Managing disease, right. and she wants to see, all right, we know half do well, half don't. If we have the genomes of all of us, right. and we follow these people for five years, right. then, with good computer software, we'll be able to say, those of you who have this type of mutation in your genome will be the ones that do fine, and the others are the ones we should be more aggressive on, because it's not nice to give someone radiation. If they were in the half, that would have been fine. Right. So we can be more aggressive with the people that need the treatments, and we can leave the people that don't alone. 
Right now, these things aren't science fiction. There are these two cases where there's enough statistical significance in these correlations, and there's a company formed around one of them called Genomic Health. Mm -hmm. And depending on, I think it's the state of 21 of these genes, they recommend chemotherapy or not. Mm -hmm. And that's one case. But we're seeing more and more of them happen as we have the correlations with, with treatment. And so this is just the beginning. Right now, as I'm speaking to you, there are at least five pharmaceuticals developing new drugs for breast cancer and ovarian cancer All right. called PARP inhibitors. But whether you should be treated with that drug or not depends on the status of certain genes. Mm -hmm. And so this is happening now, but it's only a small set of those. And we all, we had early indications this was going to be a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, because we had talked about AIDS, and in the case of AIDS, you can actually sequence and see if that virus has made a change that makes it resistant to a drug. Don't give the person that drug, because if you give a person a drug, and they fail drug therapy, you've done a huge amount of damage to the immune system and have been able to recover. But if you see they have resistance to that drug, you give them other drugs, they don't go through these crises. Once you go through a bottleneck, it's kind of like cheetahs, sorry to get off track, but there's not many cheetahs, not much diversity, they're probably not going to do well. And that happens with your immune system. So we're seeing all of this now. We're studying patients, usually a handful of genes. So even though I always talk about genomes, I always talk about thousand dollar genomes, most of the sequence being done now is 20 to 200 genes, where some set of those genes, somebody has made good correlation between that gene sequence and outcome, or that gene sequence in response to a medicine. And I'm just saying it's going to grow instead of looking at 20 to 200 genes to look at the whole genome. Uh, yes, Nate, Nathan. I love the questions because we have the same thing, and it actually led to uh, problems for almost a decade. And what we had was a huge public effort and a private effort run by Craig Venter to sequence a consensus human genome. And in one case, the pro public effort, they took 50 genomes, put them together, sequenced them, and then had a computer stitch it all together. In the other case, they had six to nine people and a lot of the DNA was from one, Craig Venter, and then stitch it all together. And they had incredible headlines. We now have a map of humanity. Uh, we're all the same, and we're done. And then it turns out, and I was lucky enough to see it, but I had to actually fight with people. Because one of the reasons I lost my company was my board said, you'll never sell very many sequencing machines, it's done. And I said, oh my God, we've got to sequence everybody. It's like, no, human effort and Craig, no, it's done. It's like, well, I don't think so, but it, it turns out it wasn't done. And some early studies we did showed that there's huge variation and that people had been misled because they took a com computer program and they said, fit everybody in one perfect consensus map. And they lost all this diversity and it's huge and it's important. So first of all, you got to sequence everybody. You have to sequence anybody that's sick, and you have to sequence a lot of people to get correlations. But we don't do it uh, by just random sampling. I think the best way is to start by sequencing sick children, you know, people that need to be sequenced and, and or around studies. Uh, but then it turns out you're not going to be sequenced just once, because you actually have to sequence a cancer. And when you sequence a cancer, and we've done this not for the whole genome, but we've done it for some genes. In a cancer, it turns out it's a population. 
And each version of your genome has changed a little bit, just like that AIDS virus is different. Each AIDS virus, there's one error or one change per 10,000, and it's 9,000 long. Every one has a different change. So your cancers are just like that. So when you study a cancer, it's not enough to just sequence a genome. You have to sequence deep enough to see the genomes of cells that might only be 1%, because they might be the ones that are drug resistant. So the good thing is just like computing, it's infinite. It's not like you're finished when it's a thousand dollar genome. It's not like you're finished because you sequence the person when you're born. And then there's people in this room who tell you Jonathan's missing even a bigger problem. Uh, it turns out if you take the heart of a 70 year old, there's modifications to their DNA, which are happening and changing how those genes are going on and off. So you probably have to sequence the modifications on top of the genome. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, it's a good business. I lost my first business. I was out of work. But the good news was I got to rethink it. I got to make it simpler. And we ended up selling it for 725 million bucks. And now uh, the company sold it to us, let us run it and sell it worldwide and believes in it. So we didn't just have to sequence Craig and his friends and, and 50 people. <laughs> And that yes. was only one aspect of moving, losing my company, but that was a big reason. Was like, genome sequencing? That's like, you only need six computers. So I've heard it. They were wrong. Yeah, so this person has just come up to the mic. My name is Meg Hutchins. Um, I'm a graduate of the College of Fine Arts and um, have an entrepreneurship in my background and I actually started out as an engineer in the 80s working in computer graphics. And I think that's why they accepted me into the art program here, because <laughs> they thought that was really cool. But um, what was that? First of all, it's fascinating, the domain knowledge. Because that's just, I, I've not heard that phrase. And it's funny, because you do that. No, I think it's so. No, no, I think it's I just, in art, I haven't heard that, but we do it. You know, I want to work in biology. I go take, you know. A, certificate in horticulture to make a certain kind of art. Um, so that's, thank you, that was very interesting, <laughs> that phrase. But my question is, I keep thinking of um, the China study in the 90s, it was a huge uh, nutritional study, and it showed that as people in China, they could track the cancer rates um, with how much protein and fats and processed food was introduced into their diet. And um, I'm just curious if there's any uh, path. Uh, I, I hear about genomes and medicine. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, the obesity issues aren't because we don't have the right medicine. They're because our food is so heavily processed. And I'm just wondering if there's any... Um, well, again, I got to be careful, because again, I always start off with $1,000 genome and genome sequencing. And then you realize that sequencing a few genes is what most people do now, and it's going to be done for the next couple of decades. But we also always forget two other things. That this DNA also figure, uh, figures into how we feed the world, so all of agriculture, uh, fuels now to biotechnology. So that's something I usually leave out. And then let's go back to genetics. And I also leave out that you can have identical twins, and if one has schizophrenia, only a 60% chance the other will. And the same with many other complex uh, genetic disorders. <laughs> there are huge environmental components. Mm -hmm. So you have two people, you sequence their genomes. Uh, one maybe you'll eat as much fat as he wants and smoke as much as he wants. Mm -hmm. Winston Churchill. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other, not so much. And, 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 and so uh, there's a huge environmental effect. But sometimes the genes can tell you who's susceptible to those environmental effects. Mm -hmm. and, 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 I hope that helps kind of answer your question. It does. Thank but you very it, much. The environment is, is, is huge. One of my best friends is, is from China. And over the period I've known him, he has watched, and he knew it was all over when he visited 30 years ago. And his niece was crying, and she wouldn't stop crying until she had the bubbly feeling in her stomach. <laughs> and it turns out that meant a Coca-Cola. <laughs> all right? And he knew that was the end. And now, literally, China 
is in a, an obesity crisis because they've never been exposed to so much freaking sugar water. And it is a disaster. My wife's a physician. It's just a disaster. Hundreds of millions of people are going to die from diabetes. Yeah, and it just seems and like so all the money. But it seems like the money making is in developing medications and testing people instead of backing up and, you know, so studying nutrition. Is there a nutrition department here? But you would be surprised. <laughs> most progressive insurance companies are starting to understand that. Yeah. They're not asking to sequence to discriminate. They're asking to uh, sequence so they can understand what they can do in preventative health. I just seem, it seems that it's, it's almost like you have to have pretty high IQ to manage your health anymore. You know, the amount of reading That's and data, yeah, you know? The real cool thing about the box, I can tell you something that would tell you today. So best, one of the best selling drugs in the world for high cholesterol is Lipitor. Mm -hmm. When you buy Lipitor, it tells you you cannot eat grapefruit. Yeah. Because if you eat grapefruit, there's a chemical in it which will stop the metabolism of it, and then it will build up, and your muscles will ache, and mm -hmm. it's pretty bad. But it turns out, that's not everybody. It's only some people that that molecule blocks that particular version of their P450 genes or whatever. So I know it would be nice to know whether I can have as right. much grapefruit as I want. And literally, there are people, shouldn't say it, that can probably smoke just fine and eat like a pig. <laughs> it's very true. <laughs> so, so, so if the boss thank tells you. us that, it will pay yeah, yeah. itself. So this gentleman's been very patient, so I'm going to turn to him. Yeah, this is a question related to the it's a question related to the entrepreneurial, uh, um, I guess, losing control of your company. I guess if you're an engineer and a scientist and you have an idea, of course, the only way you want to take it so that it can be used is you need to bring in management, you need to bring in somebody that has commercialization experience. And I wanted to know how do you find that without losing control of your idea and being, you know. First I want to get rid of a fallacy. So I was at a party recently, and this is right before Steve Jobs passes away. And this person tells me that it was pretty good that they fired Steve Jobs. Uh, because venture capitalists know this, you really have to fire founders very often and bring in professional management. And I was going, oh my god, this is the biggest myth I've ever seen propagated. So how many of you have ever worked to solve a problem? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you have had a period where things didn't go well? You're all fired. <laughs> so they forget that bad things happen, and then you figure it out and you come back. So forget it, whatever you turn. It's a big lie. So I work with a lot of venture guys, and I know exactly how they work. Those of you who raised your hand the second time, you really are all fired. As <laughs> soon as something happens, it must be inherent in your DNA, as opposed to no bad things happen. I don't believe any of that. So if you're a smart person, what I think the right thing to do is find somebody with complementary skills to you. A friend who, if, 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 if you're good at one thing and he's good at organizing, partner with him. And I think that's probably better than getting professional management. So I never hire people that say they want to manage. And I think I've hired a few thousand people and I've interviewed too many to count. And if they say they want to manage a group, it's like I try to get out of that interview as fast as possible. You only want people that want to do, and sure, they have to manage because that's just something they have to do. So if you have someone that wants to be a professional manager, you better just run. That's, that they could become a provost. See, that's yeah. what I'm <laughs> and I bet you good provost. <laughs> Don't you also want to do your economy? Yeah. Like an hour once in a while, and someone would leave you alone? I would now like to turn to this gentleman right over here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I, I wanted to ask a little bit more of the historical background. I enjoy hearing the personal history part of entrepreneurship. Uh, and in, I'm doing a PhD in technological change and entrepreneurship. Um, I, I'm wondering about the aha moments that you've had and how to translate those aha moments to just doing it. So, I mean, you talk about going after the, the, the brightest and you, you have kind of a systematic process, I'm assuming. But how do you know, how have you known that it was right time, right place, um, these ideas to translate to, to a company? And also, how do you know this is the right person to? Great questions. How, how do you know it's the right time? Uh, how, how do you know the right person? Uh, 
I think it's the right time when you can lay out the whole path in your mind and you don't have to say then a miracle happens. And I mean it literally. So in my case, before I start a company, based on one of my ideas, I usually call a friend. And uh, they're usually a friend who's very different than me. So two cases I can bring to mind was I had this great idea for inventions, and I usually call a friend who's trained in chemical engineering, uh, but has his PhD in StatMech, and he still knows how to Fortran program. And I just say, can you just make sure that it actually will work? And I simulate it. And if, and if I need a new physics or it doesn't work, I don't start it. Uh, so that's very specific. But I see so many people try to set up things, and then they, they then there's a miracle happens or something. So you just so it's the right time if you know all the things are there. Now you're allowed to skate to where the puck's going to be, right? So everybody knows the most. Two important laws are Moore's law, and recently I read, like I used to just say, you know, what Wayne Gretzky, but Gretzky's law. And so you are allowed to say, hey, I need twice as much computing power, but I'm okay because the Sandy Bridge is coming out and I know it's there. That's okay. But you can't say, and a miracle occurs where I can do it 10 times faster because of some algorithm that I don't know of yet. So I would suggest you go make sure there's someone that, at least an expert, so once I called John Anderson and said, is there anybody in the world that can solve that problem? And he said, yes. So I said, okay, then I can start a company on it. So you just got to check, reality check, don't delude yourself. So that's the timing. And the hiring the right person, I think it's really, really easy if you're disciplined. What I mean by that is if you're starving, and you're on a desert island, we used, to, we used to say this when we interviewed, everybody looks like a cheeseburger. <laughs> Don't they look great? <laughs> so you got to be careful and not have the cheeseburger thing. And it ends up being very easy. And you only have to answer two questions to hire that person. When you get a letter of recommendation, if it says the person is good, run. They <laughs> All right? A real letter of recommendation. And I'll yeah. quote ones for the people I've hired with them in the best. Uh, I've worked at Virginia Tech for 11 years. This is the best student I've ever had. And it's the only student I have that works harder than me. I hired the guy on the spot. And he was so, his name is John Schultz, and he was so instrumental. And he ended up inventing all these amazing fluidics. And it turns out he was just an electrical engineer and nothing to do with it. And so if, if you don't get a quantitative recommendation, forget it. Uh, the second thing is, and this goes back to the person who was setting up a company and needed business, make sure that person can do something best that they can do it best in the world. And you can ask people. I ask professors all the time here. Say, hey, is that person the best of the world at that? And best in the world doesn't mean they've done it all the time. Very often there's a grad student who happens to be the best at combinatorial materials or whatever. And you ask that. And then you say, can that person solve a problem I can't? If you're always going to be smarter than that person, your company's not going to work. So you always hire somebody that's smarter than you at, at something, right? Otherwise, then that's everybody you hire, has a good recommendation, smarter than you at something, and they better be able to solve a problem that you face right that day. If not, don't hire. It isn't, it really isn't that tricky. Because you guys have seen the resumes, and, you, and how many of you have faced a cheeseburger where it's just, you just so desperate? I've so, made the cheeseburger mistake. So I've been getting the sign, but uh, there's a whole lot more I wish we had time to talk about. Don't, don't leave the mic. I'll turn to you as the last question. Because there's a whole frontier of questions. You talked about insurance, and I'm very interested in confidentiality and the insurance markets. But we won't turn to that. We'll turn to this gentleman's question as the last question. A lot of discussion today on the human genome and how many sequences we're going to need to do everything we need to do with the human genome. But from my perspective, long before we get kill ourselves with genetic predispositions or we uh, run out of energy or we're affected by global warming, our own population growth, we're going to have a problem with global famine and global hunger. How many of these gene sequences are being used in agriculture right now? I, I love the question. First sequencing I did commercially 
was with Pioneer Hybrid to, to make better corn. And as I'm speaking to you, we're working with Monsanto. And I will tell you, it's a much better world working with those companies now in 2011 than it was when I first tried to do this in the mid-1990s. Everybody was just like frozen then, and now nobody is frozen. Seven billion people with incredibly powerful, effective wake-up call. And so uh, it's, it's huge, it's big, and people know it. And the regulatory, that is an area that has gotten way better. So things do get better. Well, it's, an, it's, an, it's an excellent uh, question. But now they've gotten to the please conclude now sign, so I guess I can take a hint. I, I, I do want to uh, uh, mention that uh, Jonathan has been extraordinarily generous to CMU in lots of ways, and those ways are pretty quiet. Um, one of them we made a quick reference to, which is the uh, Brain Imaging Awards, which I think we're all looking forward to the uh, conference and the events coming up later this year. Another, however, has to do with the mug. So on, on Jonathan's mug, it is, it, it, it is okay. called Rothberg's Roasters, and I don't know how many of you will know this, uh, probably many of you do, but, but that is the coffee bar in the Hunt Library, Maggie Murph Cafe, which you help make possible. And uh, there are a whole bunch of those mugs on their way to you, so I, I, I hope you like them. I love it. But uh, we're, we're most appreciative uh, this afternoon for giving us your time, your wisdom, and your wit, Thanks. and we're very happy to have had you here. So if I could, if I ask it.